What's up, everybody? Welcome to TPI, the total podcast idiot show, where we cover everything and anything related to Hardwood, the online college basketball simulator that you and I love. I'm idiot number one, Robert. That is idiot number two, Andrew, over there. Andrew, how are you doing today? Pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, I'm not in my squeaky chair right now, so uh, we won't be hearing that. Andrew is at work, so we won't have to hear a squeaky chair or the train. Or the train. Yeah, well, we have some other obstacles to deal with <laughs> andrew will never have perfect audio this we have come to accept yeah yeah pretty much <laughs> how are you doing i'm doing okay i'm doing okay yeah it's almost the end of the quarter for us so i'm excited to get school work out of the way nice oh my gosh i lost out on a prospect that i spent over 100 contacts on oh my god oh god who tell us about it sunny mcafee the the big oh, man sunny Mac. North Carolina. Yeah. yeah um yeah, I don't know. Good riddance, good riddance. We're moving on. How many contacts exactly did you spend on this man? I think 105. Ooh. On a on an 11 pot. I spent it on an 11 pot. Yeah, that's promising. It's who had seven growth last season as a junior, and, and I think he's only had like five. Which he's is only had five this year. Yeah. Respectable, but like, it, if you look at where his ratings, where his points are, like it was. Eight strength, ten interior defense, nine rebounding, nine I, outside shot. Oh. I think you obviously had every right to go after this fella. He has the has no preference to play close to home comment as well. Yeah. So you were just you know trying to jump on an opportunity. Can yeah, be a decent was, rebounder. Can be a good all around defensive player. Mm. I was first on him too in his sophomore season. Yeah. And, and then this D five bot shows up. And, oh, it's a bot. Yeah. I didn't know it was a bot. Yeah, but you know, that's this game. You live and you learn. The Lee's um, McCray Bobcats. Yeah, Lee's McCray. Oh, and they're gonna they're gonna demote. They're gonna demote. Yeah. Versus I'm hopefully gonna promote. So he he could have been playing with an LL3 team, but now he's gonna play with an LL6 team. Sunny Mac wanted to be the big fish in a small pond. Let's just be real. Mm, Sunny Mac, winners. Sunny Mac, exactly. Sunny Mac wasn't ready for that level of competition. He wasn't ready it's for true. that pressure. It's true. You're right. You're right. I mean, he ain't, he ain't ready for that pressure. <laughs> we 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 stuffed the train for an autoclave. I guarantee you, less than two percent of our listeners will even know what the hell an autoclave is. But it is a large machine that is used to sterilize objects at extremely high temperatures. So I am excited to hear random noises from the autoclave throughout the entire entirety of this podcast. Wow, we're an educational podcast too. We huh? we are an educational podcast. Yes, this is not just hardwood. We can speak about the things that we learn in our professional careers. So, what are we going to talk about today, though, in this episode? I don't know. What are we going to talk about, Andrew? Ah, uh, man, it's going to be kind of abstract today, but I think it's been a hot topic in the forums, the Discord, as it always is, as we always try to make our our episodes. Game tactics. Yes, game tactics, which might be one of the most important things in the game i would say maybe i don't know i mean <laughs> I was gonna say first off we should just put out a disclaimer we are not experts i i i mean i think i know i have an idea of what i'm doing with my game tactics but like there's times where it just gets blown up and it's like how, how why i don't know our show is called the total podcast idiots and i don't think that could apply more to any of our podcasts for me than this one <laughs> Yeah, I think when I it first... took me like what thirty percent to last season before I realized that my guys aren't good enough to play man defense. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a game tactics expert by any means. I just think I I like to think that you were just stubborn and not playing zone. <laughs> I wish that was the excuse because I would feel better about myself, but that <laughs> is not the excuse. I was not stubborn about not playing zone. I was just an idiot. All right, so I mean, let's. <laughs> let's let's start with how much how much zone were you playing back in the day back in the day yeah when I was young I'm not a kid anymore um oof I mean when I before I had made the adjustment last season by the way the adjustment was successful because I went on to win what y'all hot 13 in a row we got real hot oh that's right that's yeah right. before we played you in the playoff that was the uh end of that <laughs> I let's see. I, I found an old game. Here, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen and then we can try to pull up some box scores, I guess. So I was 19% man. I'm just looking at a random game against New Mexico Highlands when I got crushed. Okay, let's go there. Yeah. Even though I was the much higher SI team in TPI. 
So I was playing 19% man, 6% zone, and 55% pressure. And I mean, we've seen much more extreme examples of that though, right? Certainly, yes. And and it's been and we've seen it be successful. Like that's not out of the question that it can be successful. It's it's not out of the question, no, but then there are cues that I did not pick up on. Hence, mm-hmm. fatigue, everyone, heavy. <laughs> right. Right? My defensive numbers. I gave up 120 freaking points to a team that had a TPI of like 127.5 yikes yeah <laughs> yeah it was i was not maximizing my game plan let's just be real it's fine i can admit it mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah i mean i don't have anything new to tell you pretty much <laughs> but i think this is just a very good example um that you know very well basically of what we of, of just like yeah this this zone okay so six six percent zone here uh what's another what's a game that kind of change things around well if we look at my game against you okay this one right here yeah where i got a w right okay yeah yeah um oh, i yeah, was this playing... one surprised me huh yeah so this was a shift so i was playing 45 percent man which is probably still too much 32 and a half percent zone and then six percent pressure so that's a right. that's a large change right there right right yeah, yeah. um and yeah but... you beat me on the road which yeah. you know big deal definitely getting a road win yeah, so that was quite I, the change. I had a pretty good TPI. I think you're, it was okay. Yeah, you're a pretty good team. Really good team. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, shut, shut up. <laughs> That's why I don't compliment you. <laughs> um, but yeah, that subtle enough shift was, you know, enough. And I don't even know if I call it subtle. Now, if we go to the game against Moorhead. This one right here? Or no, the, down, down 114 to 110, right before the playoff. Okay, I got some things blocking some some things so. <laughs> um so here i played 25 percent man 38 essentially 38 percent zone and then just under 20 percent pressure right of course we can see more head at 69.6 percent pressure zero percent man so this is that extreme example that works you know yeah i mean he got promoted so right right they had a really good season last year um i mean the final score of this game was 114 to 110 it's crazy yeah I took 55 free throws in this game. Holy fuck. <laughs> Why did I forget that? <laughs> wow. Jeez. So, I mean, like, I think the big thing here is, like, this, this fatigue. And not to say that playing zone so much, like, changed that completely. Like, if that was the main difference compared to what we saw against New Mexico Highlands. But I think it definitely helped um, versus, like, Moorhead being at, you know, not everyone fatigued, but all of them who are have heavy fatigue. <laughs> no, I think it certainly helps. Obviously, you know, if you know anything about basketball, man-to-man defense is hard, especially if you're one of the top defenders going against the best offensive player on the other team. Now, of course, we can make generalities from real-life basketball and try to play on the hardwood, but it's never that easy. Right. Um, but man-to-man defense is difficult, right? And zone defense is a bit – zone defense requires, you know, a higher IQ, more practice, I'd say. But physically, a zone defense is 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 much easier on 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 stamina and stuff like that. Right. Um, yeah. So I mean, there's like team wide effects of playing zone, and and in general, you just had this idea to play more zone. But was there anything that gave you that idea? What you know, in in real life, we think of zones being better able to stop inside, um, the like big men scoring um hiding a player a weak player on defense maybe um but they're also more susceptible to like outside shooting giving up offensive rebounds so was there any thing that you were thinking about when wanting to shift his zone, or was it just like a general idea so usually for a basketball team if you have a if you have three guards you know you know point guard shooting guard small forward um if you have your backcourt is strong in perimeter defense kind of thing like that across the board, then you can play a lot more man. If you have one guy that is a glaring weakness perimeter defense wise, you can sort of hide that by playing a zone a little bit Mm -hmm. better. Yeah. If you have a couple of guys who are not great defenders, like Santa Clara, (laughs) then you can do an even better job of hiding those defenders by playing, um, by playing more zone, right? Like my best defender is Cole Brown 
at 15 right. and then Shane Lane and, and Rob Vernon are starters at 13 and 12. And Brown was coming off the bench last year, right? For yeah. Brown players. was coming off the bench. Yeah. Um, so you can see a majority of my guys were not great defenders. Um, you know, with that said, uh, you know, the zone can sort of hide that a little bit. And I'll, you know, Rob Vernon is a guy who has like a 19 speed, a 16 strength, and all of my guys are pretty high Q. That was one of the things, high IQ, one of the, that was one of the things that I targeted early on is high IQ players. And you'd like to think that because a zone is, requires more, you know, active communication, more thinking about what the pockets are, what your zones are and stuff, that high IQ would play into a more successful zone. But that's, again, making some sort of generalization from real life basketball. Um, but there's also a whole level of IQ that comes to playing man defense. You know, do you go under screens, over screens? How do you react to staggers? All kinds of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Switches. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we have no idea how much that plays into it. I mean, we don't even know what type of zone is being played when we employ a zone. Because in real life, there's so many different types of zones. You know, one, three, one, obviously the common two, three, but then there's the inverted three, two. You can throw a box in one at Steph Curry. Box in one. Yeah. Like, Shells. Yeah. You know? um we, this is just a zone it's like we have no idea yeah and you know zones zones can be beat really easily you know i wouldn't say really easily because they're they can be pretty effective but the two things that obviously can break down a zone really fast are really good outside shooting because you know somebody with a hairline release like you wouldn't want to play like the boxing one worked against steph sure because they were missing so many other guys in the starting lineup clay thompson mm -hmm. and kevin durant but you would never want to play a pure zone against Clay Thompson, Kevin Durant, and Steph Curry. They would destroy you, right? right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so outside shooting with quick triggers can be something that your zone cannot rotate fast enough. Obviously, dribble penetration is always going to break down many any defensive category, but, like, with zone, if you can have really good dribble penetration, somebody that can play, like, you know, like, especially I when I think about zones and how to beat them, I think about Pau Gasol, right? The Lakers, the Lakers big, because – the way that the Lakers played the triangle was Powell ran around Powell ran the offense around the free throw line. Right. And there's a lot of off ball movement and the triangle complicated, whatever, mm -hmm. but you can really break down a zone. If you have an effective passing big that can play free throw line down. Right. Yeah. But, but yeah. he had to keep his defender and we're getting way off topic here and he has to keep his defender honest because he has a good enough jump shot free throw line up that he can keep that defender honest. Right. Mm -hmm. And so there's all kinds of ways to break down zones. We have no idea how much of it like actually occurs in this game. We have no idea what, again, like you said, what kind of zones are even being played in this game. Right. So, you know, I'll, I'll give my philosophy with zones and it starts with the speed. You mentioned Rob Vernon speed. Your, your team's speed is really good for the most part, at least in this upper part on, on the perimeter. Um, you know, if I didn't know any, like, you know, your defenses, they're a lot better than they have been before. So like, I think you could probably get away with like a good amount of man, but you definitely still want to probably play zone, especially if you're playing Kyle Grant a lot more, um, or if D'Alessandro is on the perimeter or Lucas is on the perimeter, maybe. Uh, I don't think he really plays on the perimeter for you. No, he plays power forward. Right. Yeah. Um, or like if Maddox has to get more minutes for some reason, basically it's like, that's, that's when I would go play zone. Um, but like your speeds are all really good. And so to me, I would think man is fine with these speeds. Basically, like if you're playing man to man and you're fast enough, you can stay in front of your man that much better. Right. Um, and so that's really good. The other thing I look at is like the wingspans. Cause obviously the longer your arms, the more you could, ground your arms can cover the more space you can cover um and so like if you have really long wingspans i guess it probably helps in either type of defense but for some reason i think it works even better in zone um so for me i know that a lot of my teams uh or dominican specifically um really has a good wingspan so just looking over yours i didn't see like any crazy differences in wingspans? No, there's not. Yeah. So, you know, like I said, maybe just having not great wingspans in general isn't like it doesn't really help you in either defense. But like, um, I guess these three don't have great wingspans. But like Tom Mitchell has a pretty good wingspan. Yeah, no, it's only plus three. Get out of here. 
I don't know. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. But, but the wingspan is also relative to the size of the player at the position as well. Right. Like yeah. Cliff Stuckey's a really tall point guard, right? Right. Yeah. 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 So like having, yeah, that's true. Having a six ten and a half wingspan at point guard is kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, Cause he's yeah. already six, six and a half, right? Six, seven actually. or six, seven. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, oh. So yeah. no, it says 0.5. Yeah. Seven, minus 72. Oh, six, seven and a, oh, six, seven and a half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I thought you were saying six, seven, even. I was like, what? Oh, no. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. six, seven and a half. Uh, I mean, I know like Carmen here, he has a, a ridiculous wingspan, even sh even for his height. Yeah. Uh, right. You know, seven, five and a half. Palmer, when he comes in, when he comes off his red shirt, will have a pretty big wingspan for his height. Um, so, yeah, like I think like Dominican plays a relative amount, a relatively high amount of zone from for what I think. You know, we're usually in like three, five is what I usually run. Um, 35%, I mean, obviously, um, which I think is kind of high. I mean, some I, I don't really go over um, a lot. Like I don't really go to 50%, but I, I rarely go into the 20s also. Yeah. Um, but then I started to think about, so, so we talked about speed and you can see my speeds aren't like super great. Clevenger obviously is really fast, but everyone else is like not that outstanding. Um, so that's why I think the zone really works well because my guys just like spread out their arms and stay there <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. So like there's, like we talked about, there's many different ways that you can have successful zones. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, like you said, so having guys that are tall for their positions have extra long wingspans for their positions um, and are playing in a zone, that's going to be frustrating as hell for any team to break down, yeah. right? Not only the passing lanes, but, sh but even if you get an open shot, somebody, you know, hypothetically thinking somebody recovers really fast, they have a really long wingspan, they can take up your shooting space pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Like, so playing, having players that are already taller at like taller at the position, like Cliff Stuckey, for example. And then having a player that has that much longer of a wingspan at that position, it's just going to make the other point guard, you know, it's going to make him like a living hell. And if you played a lot of man and Cliff Stuckey gets beat, that wingspan doesn't have a chance to compensate for a whole lot. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And, and again, like our teams, like we're having good years. So I don't think our advice is like not warranted. I, I think like well, so another, another example of someone who's having a really good year, I just yeah. played with Oswego, is Washington, right? Mm -hmm. And I think he's yeah. a perfect example of this, right? Yeah, let's go um, over there. Yeah. Keep talking. Um, yeah, so he's he, he's an example of a team, 12-0 and in conference. Like, he you played want, a really tough non- really Do you want to go to the their box score or their team? Um, go to their team, yeah. Yeah. Um, so he's having a really good year. Um, K Henry too, shout out. But like he's got guys, so he's playing guys a little bit out of position, right? So like his point guard, I believe, is newbie, um, who is naturally a small forward, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So his point guard's newbie, who's six, six and a half. What's his wingspan? Six ten. Yeah, six ten. So again, that's another Cliff Stuckey example. He's playing Mont Montanez, Montanez. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. At, at shooting guard. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he's six five, which is pretty big for a shooting guard yeah and then, yeah yeah he's got like what a six seven and a half wingspan yeah um that's pretty good for a shooting guard he's playing barnhart at small forward mm -hmm. six six with, Rudy. with a six eleven and a half wingspan which is pretty dang good yeah that's chaos right yeah, yeah. and then he's playing he's playing billy ray hester at power forward at least mm -hmm. i think that's who he started at power yeah forward. and he's a little short at six seven but he's got nearly a seven foot wingspan. Yeah, I think that's his starting power for from what I remember. Oh, scouting he, for you. he actually went different with it. Oh, what did he do? He put Hester at small forward. Oh my goodness. I get, against and he put Fitch at power forward against me specifically. Yeah. He put then he played Loveless. Yeah, he started Loveless. Yeah. Ooh. I see I didn't have time to break this down this morning because of work. Cheeky. Cheeky. But but good, good, um, good game plan change. Yeah, I mean, Fitch was what was the guy I was really scared about. I mean, more yeah. for his weight and strength than his like uh, wingspan. Um, yeah, you know, we, we can get into later. So, yeah, love this here. Yeah, yeah so I think uh, Fitch. Let me look at something because Blankenship. So I registered one of my best players, right? And I have Blankenship, who's a true freshman, yeah. um, at power forward, who's got the size, but he's way underskilled. 
and he struggled. He went 0 for 8 from the field. He had one point. He had nine boards, um, only three personal fouls, but he was minus 20 in the game. My guess is that he got lit up by Fitch, right? I mean, so I'm going to look kinda, at the It kind of looks like it. I mean, Fitch, yeah. Fitch went 9 for 17 for 19 points. Um, yeah, his opponent didn't draw goal, that many fouls. His opponent field goal, um, uh, Blake and Chip's opponent field goal was 7 for 11 today. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, got so he, got, he got roasted. Yeah, he got hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's just good game planning on Washington's part. It's interesting you made that lineup change because, you know, I remember I was helping you try to scout this and I mean, we didn't think that was going to happen. Um, no, I didn't think so, but he's also been somebody who's been willing to tinker with his lineup. So for sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, even, even here, like, yeah, he started loveless in his past game against UCSC and he started against main press Kyle, but like at power forward and you know, UCSC isn't that great of a team. So we kind of thought, oh, it was kind of just to like get Loveless, who's, you know, a redshirt sophomore, some more playing time, basically, in development. Yeah, and, uh, and Maine yeah. at Presque Isle is 7-15 and 15 on the season. They're 6-6 six and six right. in conference, but like they're not that great of a team. So my assumption right. was that he's getting, he's getting his, you know, redshirt sophomore, like you said, starting opportunities against yeah. lesser teams. Yeah, and it kind of looks like it, based, not, maybe not completely, I mean, because – Loveless has started in a bunch of losses, actually. But then, like, in conference, he started against Barry, who's not very good, I'm pretty sure. Barry's trash. Yeah, and then and then won a streak coming off the bench. But, like, he, he started against teams that are really good, actually. Damon, I'm pretty sure, is pretty so, dang good. Louisville is, like, the number one team in the nation, like, so in he, D1. But he Texas treats – State is really good. He does not care about non-con. Right. No, I'm saying – I'm saying he – this team is kind of like, okay, if we're sure, for sure going to lose, then we might as well right. develop the young guy too. Yeah, you know? exa- yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. He used non-con games to play guys to get them as many minutes as possible. And he knew that, you know, his team was strong enough when it comes to conference play that mm-hmm. the non-con wasn't going to hold him down a lot. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, that's not quite tactics. We're good enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But tactics wise, it's just, it was a really hard, it was a really difficult lineup to try and game plan against because... You know, their shortest player is six, six and a half. They all have pretty good wingspans. He's got good size on the inside, right? This is the sort of situation where you're like, well, shit, like I have the weaknesses here that I need to try and game plan for yeah. um, to try and cover up, right? Yeah. Um, and they obviously didn't work so well because he beat me. Right. Okay. Um, so let's let's talk about the other thing. I mean, is there anything else you want to hit on the zone? Oh, yeah. There was, there was one thing, actually. So... Yeah, you can just take a screenshot of my tactics. It's not that big. <laughs> um, they also change. I change them every single game. So yeah, matter. he he spends at least two hours a night game planning. So yeah, per team. Yeah, he knows what your starting center's high school GPA was. So don't mess with him. I mean, I probably do. <laughs> um, but you can see, so like my head coach's defensive rating is, you know, it's subpar. Um, so I also think zone kind of helps with that because I know with my other team, New Rochelle, my head coach's defensive rating is like 15 or 16 or something. It's really good. So, you know, I've had, I've talked about this before where I think Dominican is like so much better at playing zone versus New Rochelle is not like, I think they should go more man to man, but it's hard to like fight that uh, thing in your head. This is why I think it should only have one team. <laughs> because like, i'm used to one thing working with one team and then i'm like oh it should work with the other team because they're like kind of similar like i build them very similarly but but you know one succeeds at 35 percent zone the other plays absolutely terribly at 35 percent zone and i you know it could be the coaches defensive ratings being completely different you know it could obviously it could be a number of other things of course as well um but yeah, so that's something else to consider. So I would say for me, the things I'm looking at when I'm zone, uh, how much zone to play, uh, my team speed compared to the other teams, especially, because like I said, I'll, I'll change it. I mean, I have that baseline number, but I'll, I'll fluctuate it up and down um, based on how I match up speed wise with the other team. Obviously my own defensive ratings, um, my team's length, and then yeah, my coach's defensive ratings. That's pretty much what I'm looking at when I want to play zone or not, how much is zone? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, 
like any number of reasons that you could want to play zone versus man. And obviously a lot of teams employ a good mix of zone versus man, like Washington, like I, just, Washington, like I just said, who I gave you the breakdown of like their teams, uh, look at Andrew clicking through the things he shouldn't be. Um, I give the breakdown of like his lineup size and all that stuff, but he, it was like 40, 40 for man and zone. So like, you know, a good mix, a good mix, never yeah. extremes, never extremes on both sides. Hey, listen, if, if you want to talk about something that changes even more than in my game tactic, it's the, it's the game management <laughs> that changes even more. So that, that doesn't matter that I showed that. Oh, so YouTube by opponent three pointers made, huh? Um, yeah, it's, it's not something that activates very often, but I yeah. have it there as like a fail safe. Um, just, you know, in case someone just comes in bombing. And then I'm like, if they make eight or more, you, you, you cut down on zone. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then I extend, I, I press a little bit more. Uh, all right. Usually this is actually a zero, to be honest, but I just have it at five in case I want to press some. Um, this this will change though based on like how much they're how much how often they make three. So if this is like a really high three-point shooting team, this this number will actually raise. Cause I I really don't want to get away from my default. Usually, usually my default is like my best game plan coming in. And then right. any of these adjustments are like in case these emergencies happen, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I have like, you know, obviously if I'm down by 20, if I'm up by 10, I have my adjustment. Um, okay. I don't want to show everything. I guess. Eh, it doesn't matter. Shouldn't, you shouldn't be showing everything. What are you doing? I don't care. Okay. So, I mean, everyone knows about pace, right? How fast you play, how fast you want to run. Um, or how often you want to like run the fast break and take advantage of it. But it's also apparently like how quickly you use the shot clock, how much you use the shot clock. Um, how, you know, how fast your possessions go. So obviously a higher positive number, you're the faster you're playing. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I think there's probably at least my con early mix con like misconception about pace was that like, if I play plus five, that means that, you know, they're looking to run whenever possible. But like you said, it's even more complex than that because you're no matter what, every team's going to get into half court offense, right? Every right. team's going to yeah. get half court offense. The thing that the thing that I want to know, and I just thought about this right now. So when we look at game logs, right? And it's like, oh, transition opportunity, two on one. And it's like, oh, Cole Brown decided to pull the ball out and run the offense. Mm -hmm. Okay, but like, why? <laughs> Like that's something that I've always been curious about because if you have a two on one or if you have a fast break opportunity, presumably that means you have numbers or a favorable situation, then what's the justification for pulling it out, running the offense? If you're a team like Santa Clara that may, that sometimes plays plus five, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know, <laughs> basically. Um, I mean, we can, I'm, I'm going to take a look at like Cole Brown's IQ, I guess. I mean, he's pretty good at 15 is pretty high. So like, He's you, wouldn't, you wouldn't think he's making the wrong decisions basically right yeah no so i, I have no idea um why why that's the case i mean obviously i've seen it too where it's like yeah they have an easy fast break opportunity but they pull it out i or you know pull it for three or something maybe i don't mind um, that yeah. hey if you're on fast break and pull it for three let's go okay fair yeah i want them attacking the basket um <laughs> there's other way there's other things to use the pace like a higher pace for though. I mean, obviously like we've talked about in the discord a lot and it's interesting. Like I know St. Mary's uses pace because it's, it's like a talent uh, disparity thing for him, you know, and uh, a number of possessions type of thing. And mathematically it makes sense. The more talented your team is, the more opportunities you have to in, to score, to impose your will, to impose that talent dis difference like the better off usually you're going to be. Um, I know Basoy kind of talked about the other direction though, actually, when, when we had him on, you yeah. know, um, uh, yeah. And, and Fury, Sacred Heart, you know, they, they think about the game more in terms of like possession control. Um, and so they use pace in different ways. Not to say that, you know, they all run fast pace. Um, they all run like plus three, sometimes plus four, but they're, they're thinking about it differently. So I think that's super interesting. I usually prescribe to how St. Mary's does it, you know, in terms of like 
if I am just that much better than my opponent, I'll up this, you know, to plus four. But right. Yeah, you can see like default I have it plus two. Wait, so. what time is it? <laughs> four twenty. <laughs> Sorry, I'm 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 childish today. Um yeah, no, I agree. It's like, you know, that's and my team again is really fast and has pretty good stamina, so I like to play fast. But also if I have really good scores, you know, the more possessions that they have, the more opportunities they have to score. So like I sort of ascribe to that logic. Now that doesn't mean that I want to stay with that logic, but that's the logic I ascribe to with my current team composition. Right. Right. You know? So I mean, in my advice for you know any new owner or any confused owner is like I I would just start out at neutral and just figure out, you know, where you like to go. And then, you know, usually these halftime adjustments that I have, I one. If I'm winning, I go slower a little bit. I don't go like negative five. I go like negative two, maybe negative one. Um, and if I'm losing, we go to like plus three or four, maybe five. I don't know. Um, if you saw me scrolling down, you probably saw. <laughs> but um, then you can kind of see like how your team does in those situations when you make those halftime adjustments. Cause like sometimes you just play better one way or the other. And mm -hmm. Yeah, that's then, some, then make your adjustments after that, you know, once you see that. That's something that I was just thinking about because when we were looking at that Moorhead game that I won 114 to 110, right? Mm -hmm. So I was down 63 to 55 at halftime. So I look at my tactics and I say, okay, that means I won the second half 59 to 47. What was different in the second half than the first half? Yeah. Right. So first half offensive pace plus three, emphasis outside, you know, but a small O. Mm -hmm. Defense man to man 45, zone. Zone 45, pressure 10. Okay, so that's what led me to have an eight point, um, extend defense zero. That's what led me to have an eight point deficit at halftime. Deficit, yeah. Second half, offense pace plus five. So it ratcheted up to the extreme. Emphasis was big O, so outside completely, which we shot six for 25, but whatever. <laughs> um, man to man 20%, zone 40%, pressure 40%, extend plus three. Okay, so that's quite the different tactics from the first half. And then I win the second half by 12 points. Yeah, I mean, so like, I, I don't know exactly which of them did, like, was the reason you want. It could be all of them at once. It could just yeah. be one of them. I, I don't, I don't know. But yeah, you kind of understand, you kind of learn how your team plays a bit better. I mean, obviously, that's looking at one game. You should, any, any new owner should be looking at several games of value for evaluating this, you know. Use non-con and your exhibition games for that. Yeah. Because like I, I, I've always worried, I've always worried so much about what my overall record is and stuff that I don't want to lose non-con games at any cost, right? Mm -hmm. But but like number one, don't waste red shirt game player games on non-con. <laughs> That's a mistake that I've learned the dumb way. And number two, you can experiment more in non-con because your con conference season is what's gonna matter in terms of like promotion relegation, you know. Right. I mean there's there's a, it always depends I, I know you you I, you learned a lesson it's it's it depend the situation depends um and obviously just the more seasons you play like the more experience you get with like what you're comfortable with what your team should like to run and obviously you have players cycling out but yeah you also get new players that you figure will fit into that system um and you know there's also it seems like there's this lag effect with players you will get into like more game to game, but like players coming in, you know, new players may not just like get the system in general at first anyways. And then as they play more and more with under your system, they'll get more comfortable. They play better, you know? So it's like, I feel like it's the same as if you took a small forward and played him at point guard. And then after four development periods, he gets the little PG, you know, and after six, he gets the large PG indicating that he's, has a oh, certain level quick. yeah no i know i'm just throwing out arbitrary yeah, numbers I know, I know. but yeah but like basically indicating that like you know he has proficiency at the position i think of defense sort of the same way so if you're playing a shit ton of man and then you suddenly go to a larger amount of zone right i think and this is completely just speculation but i think that the um that the you know your players would have needed to have more experience in zone yeah like so you're saying I, I totally agree i totally yeah. agree like well just because like they might play more zone like percentage wise they might not be effective good. at it yeah right yeah, yeah totally totally i haven't really like looked at how that is because just because like game to game it's so hard to analyze because it's such a small sample either way 
but you know, I think you're totally on right on the nose there. Yeah. Um, same with, same with pressure, you know, it's like they may press a lot, but maybe they just foul a lot too. You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, pr pressure is something also that like, you know, you can pressure a lot and it's great, but you end up fouling or you don't know how to properly pressure and it's easily broken. Mm -hmm. Um, or, you know, like you said, you put yourself in bad positions and foul or whatever it may be, but like, I, I have a great example. You see, like, I don't press a lot, right? My default is five. Usually a lot of the time is at zero. I, I pressed my last opponent like quite a bit. I'll show that because it's already happened and they're a bot. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> ah. Um, I pressed 20% in the first half. I was lit winning by so much that, uh, we backed off, which I actually didn't want to happen. I want them to keep it on, but like we only forced 16 turnovers all game. Um, with 20% pressure, I would definitely expect more yeah. with, with this big of a talent disparity. Like it's a bad team. Yeah. Of, yeah. Yeah. I, I would honestly expect more in just the first half. Uh, I would expect like 16 in the first half, maybe <laughs> <Love. laughs> Maybe not that much, but, um, yeah. So like, like you said, I, my team, my guys are not used to pressure pressing that much. So like, maybe that was just like the lag effect. I don't know. So you also went to 0% pressure in the second half, right? right because right, you had right. such a large lead, but then the second half discrepancy was much tighter, right? Right. Yeah. It was much tighter. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I did not want that to happen, but <laughs> yeah, it's all good. It's all good. Any, any win, any blowout win, you know, this is still blowout win um, or have no injuries. I'm happy, especially on the road. I'm, I'm good. Yes. But of course, we're just trying to look at the trends that present themselves from the data. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So, um, so that's pressing kind of, I mean, obviously pressing, you know, you're, you're applying that full core press. You want to create turnovers. Um, you want to create havoc pressing a lot. Like you can foul a lot, basically. I think that's the main downside. I think you get fatigued more probably too. But so, so when it comes to pressure percent versus extend defense, do you want to sort of mm -hmm. talk about those a little bit? Yeah. So these are the things that I probably changed the most, I think. Yeah. So pr pressing, you know, pressing, I'm looking at they're specifically their point guard, but also their shooting guard and their backup point guard, um, their speed. Cause like, if they're super fast, they can just run away from your guys. Like al almost no matter what they're handling or their IQs are. I mean, if they're like both really low, then still press the sh crap out of them. Yeah. Um, even if they're 20 speed. Um, but yeah, so I'm looking, I'm looking at handling speed and IQ basically. Um, Oh, with zone, actually, I found this is my secret. If they have really low IQs, but like good in handling, good in speed, I play a lot more zone, but I don't press because like I figure if they're dumb, they can't break the zone as well. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, That's funny. Um, with press it, pressure, yeah, uh, IQ, handling, and speed are like the main things I'm looking for. And again, in relation in relation to my own team speed, my own guards speeds, and so that's why I don't press a lot with Dominican because again, my guards are not that quick. Uh, I have like an eleven speed point guard, the six seven guy. I got, got like got like a twelve speed, uh, six three shooting guard. So like, it's not slow, but it's not super fast, uh, or they just like swarm. Um, and you know, I think you should consider your own team's perimeter defense abilities because I think that helps. But yeah, that's what I would look for when I'm like determining how much to press. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And, um, you know, when it comes to extend defense, right? So like more so I'm saying like, let's say you are Moorhead, for example, and you are pressing literally 90% of the time. Yeah, yeah. Right. So then let's say he didn't bother to ever change his, um, his, his extend defense percentage, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if it's at zero, but he's pressing 100% of the time, th does extend defense even matter? Um, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I typically think of like extend defense as like strictly a half court type of thing. Right. That's what, what I would have thought of it as well. If it's plus five, you're picking up the ball handler at mid court. If it's minus five, right. you're literally packing the paint. Right. Asking right. for three in the key. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know how often they really relate to each other, but you're kind of right. Like if you're just pressing a lot, like, do you even get back enough to? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're picking up the ball handle or full court, right. Or, right. or three quarters court. So like, would it really matter? Like... Wow. Look at, look at the respect they showed me. Six, six percent man. <laughs> oh, six whole percent man. Wow. Moorhead. <laughs> 
Um, sorry, I interrupted. My, my read. No, I was just I was just thinking about like you know, you know, let's say what if you have what if you're zero percent press and you're plus five, then obviously in that scenario that's when we think, um, you know, in that case that uh, um, I just like lost my train of thought. Uh, oh, that you're picking up the ball handler at like at half court, but that you're not right. you're not pressing him like full court wise. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, with extend again, I only think of this as like a, a half court thing. And so, like, what I look for basically is how many points in the paint they sc actually. And I don't really look at points in the paint because that can be construed. Um, you know, we've talked about it before with like looking at team stats. I, I look at how many threes they take in relation to every other field goal, basically. Like if it's under that 33% mark, um, if it's like 25%, I'll usually go like negative two, maybe negative three, if they also have like a really threatening big man. Um, if if they're like Hartford that those few years where like Hartford took like 33 threes in one se whole season, <laughs> then I would go negative five. <laughs> negative you guys, five of them. You guys combined to shoot 16% from three. Oh, I know. Is that what you're eight attempts, yes. <laughs> that was really bad, yeah. Like, building bricks for, my gosh. And I only lost my six. Oh, for 10 from three only, by himself. I only lost my six, too. Yeah, you took 42 free throws. He, he had lost, 61 though. rebounds as a team. This is a yeah. wild game. This is a wild game. It's like the opposite of your game, almost. Yeah. Impressive. This is a wild game. Because <laughs> it was very defensive, but it's still so high scoring for some reason. He had 16 steals off of you? Yeah. You had 24 turnovers. Hey. Stucky. Yeah. Wow, Stucky grew a lot between last season and this season. Well, so the thing with Stucky is, like, again, he's slow, right? And Zorich is really fast. So, again, that – that because, obviously, we've gone over Moorhead presses a lot. So, like, Zorich just hounding Stucky is a, is a big deal because of that speed difference. Um, Slash to my glue, Stucky. Yeah, it's like ready for Austin. Stick to my or skip to my list. Skip to my. Oh my goodness. Okay. Okay. That's right. Uh, and it works glue and stuck. That's why I kind of like it. Um, last year was Stucky's first like full year starting as point guard. So I think that again we talked. I just mentioned it with like the lag effect, and I think we were talking more small uh, size or small like examples, but like on a larger scale, it takes a, a while for a new. A, freshman or retro freshman even even juco uh, juniors um like it takes them a while to get used to playing to be effective at least i mean not to playing necessarily but yeah definitely seems like there's some i don't know i call it lag effect yeah yeah i mean installing a new game plan it is going to take time that just makes sense right that's right. something that from like common sense standpoint is going to take time mm -hmm. um especially if it's a large variance from what your normal game plan is and so a lag effect is just how effective is that particular game plan you know executed by your team right well i'm also saying like a, a, a person a player being yeah. inputted into the lineup as well too yeah that's true yeah like they have to yeah that makes sense i i often wonder about like if your team is much, much higher IQ and you swap, you not swap game plans, but you change your tactics quite frequently, whether or not having a much higher IQ affects that, like the, okay. the effectiveness of incorporating that game plan faster. I mean, I don't know. I'm not, I don't really run high IQ teams, to be honest. So I don't really know for sure. <laughs> um, but I would like to think that it is. And I would like to, I, I would like to see that be the case. Yeah. Um, I say I don't run high IQs. I have four fifteens, but then like you know, seven six seven is not that great. Four fifteens uh, is pretty good though. Yeah, that's pretty solid. Well, he he's redshirting for your so. top players. Who's redshirting? Span. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Well, like down here, like twelve, six, eleven, yeah. five. I have 19, 17, 15, 14, 16, 14, yeah, 13, so you're 13, the, you're 15, the 14, 13, you're the 13. Jeez, All man. of my players that are in the rotation are. 13 or above an IQ. I never even stopped to realize that. Yeah, well, it's something you prioritized when you were first starting and, and continue to. We are Santa Clara and we have high standards for high academic standards for our players. No, I just want dumb physical beasts. We, we, we don't get to pick and choose whoever we want. We take the best of the best. Look at this boy. He's, he's got a five IQ, but he's 87 feet, 290 pounds. <laughs> 
<laughs> with a 40 inch vertical <laughs> and a 7'7 seven, seven wingspan normal 7'8 he, 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 he wouldn't qualify academically for us yeah he comes here <laughs> down it. look at this guy oh my god dude. no yeah Anyways. That, guy, that guy's a physical monster yeah yeah um so yeah tactically i think i think that's a lot of what um i wanted to go over today i don't know do you have any other things um no i think you know tactics are fickle and tactics are always going to depend on the matchup they're going to be context dependent for matchup and i would like to think that i have learned about tactics but the more and more i try to employ them the more and more i don't know if they work as well no so yeah i agree it's like it's <laughs> you know like you can come up with a game plan for a specific team and the tactics that are going to best counter that team but then like you know we tried game planning for washington and he was able to change his game plan around and it could completely counter what i did you know it's that's just yeah. that's just how it goes yeah obviously like if you're listening you know i don't if you don't want to like reveal all your tactics you certainly don't have to um but you know if you have any thoughts like let us know but i think we we often have this conversation in the discord uh in the forums but you know i think it's important to continue to have i don't think this is our last episode on tactics um you know again there's so much we don't know this is just how we think about it basically um yeah so still a lot to learn for sure yeah i i i think you know it's something that we will continue to to come back to um be, just as our tactics change our preferences as our teams change and sort of how it goes um but you know this is another good example of a, a, a type of podcast where we should get somebody or maybe two guests on like it'd be really cool to get two people that do different tactics like you said mm -hmm. so like somebody like naf who employs the like i want maximum possessions for my for my players versus somebody who said okay well i want to slow down and control possessions or something like that and then get their mindsets back and forth i think that'd be a cool chance to do that yeah yeah we do need to have a guest soon we, have we need to have a guest now. yeah we'll be reaching out we'll be reaching out to some people yeah yeah and uh you know i want to make one quick announcement it's not about game tactics but i think naf came up with a really cool idea um to uh, uh come together with all of the west coast conference real life west coast conference basketball teams and create in the rivalry slots for hardwood a sort of per se non-con tournament um, and, you know, we've been reaching out to all the, the actual teams for the West Coast Conference. We have it set up where we're going to have two pods with relegation and promotion. You know, you have to control this outside of the game. Um, but I just think it's a really cool opportunity. If you don't have rival spots set up, start reaching out to some teams that are in your actual school's conference in real life. You know, Pac-12 or something could be really cool. Big 10, even the smaller ones, Sunbelt. Um, and just try and get, what, what conference is Dominican even in? I don't know. There's some small, like they're not D1. So it's, yeah, it's, it's not a uh, well known. I, I kept on every time you guys were talking about it, though, I wanted to be like Dominican has entered the West Coast Conference. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I just think it's a really cool. It's a, like I'm glad that we got it set up, but I think it's something that could really be done by a lot of conferences, a lot of teams in this game. If you don't have rivalry spots set up or even if you do and you want to mix it up, it's just a really cool opportunity to play some teams that would normally be playing in real life. Um, and I want to thank, you know, NAF for, for spearheading a lot of that. He even came up with like a whole spreadsheet with the pods based on next year's weighted TPI and stuff. And so, you know, he gets into it. NAF's a, NAF's a pretty good, uh, um, you know, pretty good member of this game, I'd say. Um, but I think it's a really cool system and I look forward to starting it next season. And, you know, we'll, we'll definitely have to give some updates on it. You know, who, who did what in the West Coast Conference bracket and stuff. So it's gonna be really yeah. exciting. Nice, nice. Yeah, we'll have a little West Coast conference like thing for a section of this. Yeah. Segment. But like if somebody else wants to set up the same thing with their conference and actually gets it, then let us know and we could shout it out and, you know, talk about the results and stuff like it's a really cool opportunity for segments wise. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I like that. Yeah. Um, I wanted to yeah mention keep on checking out uh, Cough Daddy's, you know, write ups on our conference obviously that's what you know y'all should be checking out <laughs> no i mean on his uh, recruiting thread because you know he's he's still doing every single day every four or five star that commits um in writing up you know the history of the recruiting battle as best as he knows i mean he only started at the beginning of the season so he doesn't maybe know 
the previous season's worth of what happened, but like, this is as good as it gets, you know, talking about the roster situation, this player's coming in, this about this recruiting, sorry, the scouting report on the player and how they might fit into the roster. So I think that's really cool. Yeah. Um, he's dude, still doing it. Cop Daddy does a lot of work, a yeah. lot of work. And, you know, takes a lot of time researching things, even his write-ups of all of our games day by day, like oh going gosh. through all the box scores and summarizing the best key points and stuff. He does a lot of work. So, you know, I really appreciate it. Um, he took over Maryland, who is in a very bad situation um, and is winless in conference, but he travels to the second worst team in the conference, Wingate tomorrow, who's two and 10, and he's going to get his first conference win. Let's go, let's go, let's Terps. go Maryland. Let's go, let's go, Terps. Let's go, Cough Daddy. We're rooting for you. We're rooting. I think I might be more excited to check the results of that game than my own game tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I want to see the write up should um uh, should Maryland get a W. What a glorious day, right? It would be a glorious day, yeah. Because you can't cough, you can't go winless in conference. Yeah. yeah. If I if I'm not gonna promote, I might just take a game against you. <laughs> even Tampa won. Even Tampa won today. Tampa was what, 0 and 21 or something? Yeah, they were 0 and 21 to coming in. Yeah, they won. They beat, I don't even remember who. Biola, I think. Wait, really? Biola? Yeah, I think so interesting by, by like one at home in tampa uh there, there are still three undefeated teams in d2 st louis st edwards right and, who and colby oh colby oh wow the one who was like didn't they have a funny pr uh i think they did like they, that european coach weren't they the one that was the european coach? <laughs> yeah it, oh. it, it was mules mantra I, one degree defense, two degree defense, three degree defense, four degree defense. Don't ever underestimate the heart of a mule. And then he had the one, what I consider to be good basketball was rejected by many people as lacking in spectacle, but I'm much happier, more likely to win 50, 150 than lose 128 to 124. Hey, what a legend. I mean, they, they've been winning every game, so you can't, can't hate on that. No, I hope he reaches out to us because he is a legend for the, yeah. for the post alone. You're right. All right. Um, yeah, I think I think that about covers it. Again, we're not done with tactics. I think this was just kind of like a little appetizer. I think we'll we'll get into it more. So quickly, LSU is still undefeated in D1. Shout out to LSU, 22 0. Oh, yeah. There are two teams with one loss, Marist and Gardner Webb. There is only one team now that is winless. That's Willamette. Oh. Yep. Up there in Oregon. Willamette at 0 22. I know some people who went to Willamette. Oh, no. So do I. Um Tampa got the W, and then surprisingly, uh, sitting down there at the bottom, Virginia. Oh, really? Yeah. Our, the, I think R. Jones, I think. Is the, the Cavaliers president. are 1 in 21. Rones Ivy. Rones, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the Cavaliers, uh, yeah. And then let's just give a quick little. In D3, is Hood, is, Hood, is Hood still undefeated? They were yesterday. That's what yesterday. No, there are no undefeated teams in D3. Hood um, lost. Oh my god. So there are four teams with one loss. Hendricks, mm -hmm. Hood, Worcester State, and Husson. Husson. Yeah. Um, but there are okay. there are there are no teams that are defeated. However, in D3, there are one, two, three, four, five, six teams that are winless, including Virginia Tech. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Yeah. Um actually, you know, if if anyone has any questions regarding their tactics, like also like let us know again don't you don't have to like give away your whole game plan like i do but you know ask ask us some questions we'll try to offer help what Vir is that what happened virginia tech has a president and he's active uh it's kind of he's kind of new though right They're yeah new. so he started march 4th but he has he logged in today it's like a second encounter for someone i think too. probably would you fang is the president name oh yeah that's that's the walsh uh boston uh president the one who like like writes broken english ones because i think it's written in google translate gotcha yeah the, the walsh president is gia fang yeah okay well hey i don't care as long as teams like virginia tech are good doesn't matter oh they're active and like i you know i like i like the way they run uh so we'll see i think both of his both of his original teams are like in the same conference <laughs> wait really yeah yeah he has Walsh, boston too i think so yeah search like gia i think is or jerry, jerry woo yeah jerry woo and gia Fang, boston. Like you said. yeah yeah okay well boston's d2 so 
and it's obvious it's the same person because the PRs are like so similar. Yeah. <laughs> and no one can put Google Translate, uh, do Google Translate like that so closely. <laughs> okay, these these are actually kind of cool. So season summary for 2016. It's a pity that this season is only one step away from giving birth to a league. Although there has been a low, long, a long low tide in recent years. Thank you, fans, for your support throughout the season. <laughs> Next, check, there, check if there's a chance to hit tournament. If not, I can only play invitational games. I like it. Yeah, I like check it. Check if there's a chance. <laughs> I like it, yeah. I like it. Make sure to find the head coach who has coach. <laughs> All right, it's time to go watch actual college basketball. Uh, don't you have class? Yes, I do. I was not going to say that, but I was trying to be cool, but it's okay. I, I, can, edit. I can edit that out. No, no need to edit. We don't edit. Yeah, we do, but that's fine. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll, I'll see you this weekend. I'll talk to you. Yeah. Well, I'll, see, I'll talk to you lots, but uh, I'll... Unfortunately. Yeah, uh... I'm just kidding. Yeah, we'll talk. We'll talk. But, um, you know, our next show will be Sunday. We'll do another wrap up show and hit on some teams that are hot and some conferences and stuff. And we'll go from there. Sweet. Cool. All right. All right. Total Podcast Idiots signing off. Peace. Hiya.